Sawa. Karibu sana, Daktari. You can take over now from there. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, um, Frederick, and thank you very much, Harrison, um, for organizing these these sessions. I think it's very important uh, that we, when we are talking about NCDs, non-communicable diseases, that everybody in the country is part of it. That is uh, the public, the policy makers, the healthcare providers, people in the community, right in the village, and also, of course, the media people, because um, uh, media has a lot of uh, power, and that power can be used to impact on NCDs positively. So I'm glad that I was given this session. I'll put my video up so that I can maybe uh, not have interruptions in, uh, because of my internet, but uh, that's, that's me. So I'll start off by just um, but saying who I am, I'm Zipora Ali, everybody calls me Zippy. I'm a medical doctor, specialist in palliative care and in public health. I am the executive director of Kenya Hospices and Palliative Care Association, and also um, worked previously with Nairobi Hospice for 16 years as the senior medical officer. And I'm also, uh, our organization, Kenya Hospices and Palliative Care Association, is a very active member of NCD Alliance Kenya. We work together to bring the voices and, and issues of people living with NCDs, non-communicable diseases, uh, into the forefront of health issues in this country. So today I just decided maybe the best thing is to start by introducing what palliative care is, because I think some of you maybe uh, on this, on this uh, um, session are wondering what is palliative care, and uh, if we don't understand what it is, then we might not be able to actually advocate for it. And palliative care is really very important across all life-threatening illnesses, and we'll see that as I continue with my presentation. So um, I just want to ask um, if we know, are aware of this terminology. Do we know what palliative care means? Can I get a sponsor or a volunteer, sorry, not a sponsor, a volunteer, one person to, can I just pick on somebody here because I have, I can see the names the, 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 you know, not the names, but the, the initials of people's names. Um, I'll start with the first one I'm seeing, J G J G J G are you able to unmute yourself and tell us what you think palliative care is? Okay, I don't think they have heard me. Or, okay. Maybe just yeah, right. that's John Kikonyo is, is, mm -hmm. is unmuted. Yes, John Kikonyo. Okay, I think they are, they, are, they, are, they are muted. Maybe they don't want to say what it is. Let's go to the next person, AM. Um, can you tell us what you think palliative care is? Or if you have ever heard of it or not heard of it? Hello, I'm Aida. Mm -hmm. Aida, yes. I can say you. palliative care is taking, is taking care of someone medically, mm -hmm. whether they are, they are not fit mentally or emotionally, just taking care of them medically. Just taking care of them medically. Yeah, whether they are not fit emotionally or mentally. Okay, so uh, that is what um, uh, she says what palliative care is, Aida. Uh, anybody else wants to add on to that? What about hospice care? Has anybody ever heard of a hospice? For example, in Nairobi, you have Nairobi hospice. Does anybody know what they do? Uh, SE? Um, I, think, I think hospice care is uh, when somebody is diagnosed and uh, probably the disease is cured. It's different from palliative care. So uh, that is, who, that is who's, who's speaking? Lolita. Okay, Lolita says she thinks it's a care that's given somebody who's cured and it's different from palliative it's care cured. it's like they, they'll be diagnosed with a disease and then get cured from it okay good um okay that is another explanation for hospice care 
end of life care what is end of life care anybody want to explain to us what end of life what they think end of life care is if they are heard of it CK CK that's Caroline Katana Caroline Katana do you want to tell us what end of life care is Caroline is quiet. I don't think there's a volunteer on that. What about supportive care? Anybody to who, can, who will volunteer to us? Yes, yes. Caroline, Hello. is it correct? Yes. Uh, and Mikia. Oh, and Mikia. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, I'm Go saying on. end of life, end of life care uh, first to the last stage of uh, palliative care. When when nothing else can be done for you, you are just helped now for your you know, almost for your demise. <laughs> okay, thank you uh, for that uh, explanation. Close to it. Uh, thank you. And uh, supportive care. Mm -hmm. And what about survivorship? Anybody wants to explain to us what survivorship is? Is there anybody in this session who has had a patient, a family member, a friend, a neighbor that you know very well that you are close to that has had cancer? Yes, I've and, heard of one. Eh? Yes. Just uh, tell us what uh, a little bit about them or what you think survivorship in Okay, most of the time maybe if i can relate the survivorship uh, and, and the, the cancer cases is that maybe this patient has been suffering with that uh, disease for a long but she tries or he tries himself to make sure that uh despite any challenge that may come on, on the way he's, he's using medication that makes him or her to survive Yes, thank you for that. Um, definitely, you do have somebody who has uh, survived cancer in your family or maybe in uh, you know, networks. Thank you for sharing that. So, um, yes, everybody has got uh, has given different definitions, and um, we will now look at what is exact. What are the exact? Uh, what are the exact meanings of these words um, that we are talking about? Um, so. Um, Supportive care and palliative care sometimes are used interchangeably. People sometimes might say supportive care, people might say palliative care. They are in many ways uh, complementing each other, but they might have different meanings. People usually prefer the word supportive care to palliative care because yeah. uh, somebody needs to put their, 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 their mic, please. So people sometimes prefer, in the Western culture, for example, people prefer to use, the, when somebody says supportive care, then palliative care, because palliative care has mis been misunderstood to mean, you know, care for those who are dying only, which is not really the truth. So um, these two words sometimes are interchange interchangeably used, but they might have different meanings as we will look. But the most important thing to remember that these two focus on the quality of life, on, on, on ensuring that the patients we have who are living with NCDs, whether it's cancer, diabetes, hypertension, cardiac diseases, sickle cell, mental illness, you know, epilepsy, uh, congenital diseases that children are born with, that all these people are living a good quality of life. And that's what we focus on, the healthcare professionals and support teams around these patients, try to ensure that they have a good quality of life. And what is a good quality of life? When you have your symptoms controlled, if you have very distressful symptoms, when you have this, your psychosocial spiritual and other needs financial needs even included addressed when you have your family with you when you have care support this is what we talk about when you have a good quality of life you can eat your food you can go to bed you can sleep you don't you know you don't uh, stay awake the whole night because of pain you know you can go to the toilet you can talk to your family this is quality of life
So quality of life, of course, is subjective. Somebody might say my quality of life was this and this before, but our focus is really to ensure that your day-to-day -day living is improved and for as long as possible. So it talks about, we are, we are focusing on the quality and the quantity, if, if possible, to also, of course, uh, increase survivorship, extend survivorship. So again, like I said, people usually want the word supportive, supportive care instead of palliative care, but it's not, it's not because palliative care is not a good thing, it's because of the way people, uh, con, you know, kind of uh, uh, translate one into, into a different thing. So um, palliative care is not about dying, it's not about giving up treatment, it's about living. It's about supporting the patient and their family members to live well, and we'll look at the definitions in a little while. So I will not. This 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 presentation has been shared as a PDF, but uh, I think being the media, you probably have a lot of curiosity, and you you do look on the website for so many things. So if you look at the WHO website, you'll see that WHO has defined palliative care for adults, and has also defined palliative care for children, and it's really talking about. From the time you make a diagnosis of a life-threatening illness, that is a disease that might be not curable, or may be curable, but it will take some time to get cured. Then you start supporting the patient with the, 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 their needs. And these needs might be uh, their uh, physical symptoms for cancer patients, mostly pain is a very, very distressful symptom. So they need special medication to treat their pain. For example, opioids that sometimes in some countries are not even allowed so you might need to look at some of those things when you're looking on the website. What is allowed in Kenya? What's not allowed in Kenya? The good thing about Kenya is that we do allow opioids for pain management for cancer patients and other uh, distressful, severe, moderate to severe pain, condi pain, pain conditions. So it's about their physical, their physical symptoms, and it's not only pain. Cancer patients, for example, can have over 65, uh, over 65 uh, types of symptoms. So all these symptoms need to be addressed. The psychological issues, the emotional issues, what they are going through as a person, the family caregiver, the family breadwinner is now no longer the breadwinner. What happens to him? What happens to the family? How does this impact on this person? The why me? Why did I get this disease? Am I the one who did something wrong? Have I, have I, you know, offended my creator? Those uh, spiritual needs are also very important. So this is really, uh, palliative care is really focusing on all these needs of these patients. And we ensure that the palliative care providers do a very good, very thorough, very thorough assessment of these needs of a patient and, you know, record them, put them down, and then of course now look at how they are going to support these needs of these patients. And it's not only about the patient, it extends also to the family members. When a patient is sick in the family, and they'll take cancer for example, or someone who has got advanced diabetes and has lost their limb or is blind or has got renal failure. This is very stressful for the family members. They go through a lot of suffering themselves. And so we also extend this care to the family members, especially in terms of counseling the family members, supporting them to take care of the patient at home if possible, giving them the information they need, teaching them how to dress wounds, how to administer medicines, and of course, supporting them in their grief. And once the patient, if the patient dies, supporting these family members even after the patient has died. That is what we call bereavement support. So it's really about so many other things. It's about improving quality of life, addressing their symptoms, physical, emotional, psychosocial, working as a team, supporting the family members, and just being able to direct this patient to make informed decisions, telling them about their disease, breaking bad news, and then counseling them. Those are very important things. But it doesn't just talk with adults, it also goes to children. For children, we also talk about a holistic approach to care, where we actually consider things like their body, mind, and soul, that they're able to, to, to receive these services at every level of care, whether it's at the Kenyatta National Hospital or whether it's at home, that they should be able to address, they should be able to receive this same care. So it's also, again, from the time you make a diagnosis throughout the illness, whatever the trajectory of the illness is, and it can be provided, like I said, at every level of care and includes the family. When a child is sick, family members become very devastated. It's very difficult for them. So even these people need more support than ever because they have a sick child in the family. And a dying child is even, makes it even more worse because we know uh, parents are not uh, supposed to outlive their children and children are supposed to grow up into young adults, you know, in, into old age and then all of a sudden they're sick and maybe dying. That also is very distressful to the family members. So palliative care addresses all these issues. We might not remove the disease, we might not necessarily stop the death, but we try to bring comfort into the patients and families' um, life. 
So, okay, so palliative care, like somebody said earlier on in one of the definitions, it is a medical care. Yes, it is medical care for both adults and children living with serious illnesses. This is across all ages. It is for, It focuses on providing patients with relief from symptoms, for example, pain, like I said earlier on, it could be pain, it could be cough, it could be fever and many other things. And now even in COVID-19, uh, there's a big need for palliative care because COVID-19 patients come with a lot of symptoms which need to be addressed. It also looks at things like stress of a serious illness, you know, whatever the diagnosis is, it doesn't matter. It's not only for cancer patients. People always think it's only for cancer patients. It is for any disease that is serious, Hello. that affects patient's quality of life. So the goal is to improve the quality of life for both the patient and the family, not just the patient alone, patient and family. And also we work as a team for palliative care, supportive care, all these other things we talked about, end of life care, we have to work as a team. Because like I said, the patient's needs are very diverse. They could be needing symptom management and the doctor might be the good person to come into it or the nurse. They could be, they could be needing wound dressing and the nurse probably is the, uh, you know, especially wound care nurses are the best people to do that. We will be needing a counselor for some, for some counseling issues. They will be needing a spiritual caregiver. It could be an imam, a, a chaplain, a, you know, um, a, a priest. All those people are very important. So again, all those things are done by a team. Only one person cannot provide palliative care. We have to work as a team. Like I said, it's even at any age, at any stage of the illness, from the time you make a diagnosis, if you come and tell me, oh, Zippy, you have cancer, stage one or two, three, my life becomes upside down. Everything becomes a blur, it changes. So I need somebody to support me through during this diagnosis with this bad news, to be able to support me psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually, and somebody to look at my other physical needs. Throughout my illness, as I, as I receive treatment for my cancer, for example, I will still have these symptoms. I will still have these uh, depression issues. I will still be in denial, angry, and I will need somebody to support me all, all, all the time during this illness. It doesn't matter what the trajectory of the illness is, even if you're aiming at cure, we also need palliative care until whatever it is that we can until the, whatever the trajectory of the illness is. So it is very important that we understand palliative care is not just coming to when the person is dying. It's from the time you're making that diagnosis of an illness. So supportive care, again, is about supporting a patient who's going through treatment. And I specifically, again, think about cancer patients because cancer treatment is very devastating. People when uh, people go through chemotherapy, which is very, very toxic, because those are toxic drugs you're giving to the patient to kill the cancer cells, but at the same time, they destroy the normal cells in the patient. And that's something we can't really avoid right now. And then, of course, we give radiotherapy. Radiotherapy has its effects. It can, can, it can cause, uh, you know, it can cause burns, can cause many other things. It can cause, uh, it can cause narrowing of, 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 of the thora, you know, of the, of whatever the place you're giving the, the, the treatment. And we also have hormonal treatment, which has its side effects, surgery. So during this treatment, patients will go through side effects. Uh, for chemotherapy, for example, most patients will start vomiting. They'll have nausea and vomiting, very severe, very severe. They lose their hair, their skin becomes dark, they have their nails come off. So they need support during this treatment. They need support during the treatment. So this could be physical and psychological symptoms that need to be supported. And then of course, um, the side effects across the continuum of the cancer experience throughout and even after the treatment people will still be seeing some side long-term side effects they need to be supported during this time and of course sometimes rehabilitated somebody might have their, their limb removed because of a cancer or because of advanced diabetes so how do they now go back into a normal life when they don't have a leg now you need to be able to uh, rehabilitate them into 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 a into a stage where they can be able maybe to continue taking care of themselves, and then of course supportive care also looks at uh, uh, preventing cancer, um, maybe uh, trying to treat them so that they don't have metastasis, what we call the spread of cancer, or try if it's a diabetic patient, from the time you make a diagnosis, you put them on treatment and you ensure that they take their medicines properly, so that you can actually minimize the long-term effects of the disease. So these are very important. Survivorship, when somebody has survived cancer, for example, we were told uh, by one of our participants that uh, they have a relative who survived cancer. This person during the survivorship, sometimes one of the things we do in this country, forget about survivorship. Once you're treated, you are just left to go into the community, but nobody tells you how to survive. Maybe you lost a breast. How do you survive without a breast? We know a breast is an important organ for a woman. It's part of her beauty. It's what God gave you. It's what makes you feel as a woman. How do you survive without a breast or two breasts? You know, so it can survivorship is telling a patient you can actually put this 
you know you can wear a bra that shows that you have a breast you can you know we have all these things that we can put on that you can actually help you maybe physically look well but also we go through a lot of emotional counseling for these patients somebody might say i my cervix um have cervical cancer and now because of treatment and everything i'm not able to have you know uh, sex how do we counsel this person how do we also counsel the, the partner of this person how do we actually also tell them other ways of satisfaction apart from just penetration so all these things are very important and supportive care is also it also includes end of life care because somebody might be dying how do we support this person who's dying how do we support the family members of the dying person so all these things are very important in terms of supportive care survivor so i've already talked about it the person who has got cancer and has survived it or who has got an illness that was life-threatening and has survived it will need to be supported throughout their life so that they can you know at least try to be to live a normal life as much as possible so again that is very important um, people think that if you have had cancer other things things might happen you know that uh, you might never be the same again yes maybe in many ways you might never be the same again but you can go back to a normal life i have many people i've known who tell me i was diagnosed with cancer 30 years ago and they're still alive in africa and in kenya unfortunately people come to the hospital when it's too late mostly most people come when it's a bit too late to treat them from the cancer so most times they'll come and has spread to other parts of the body and so the treatment might not necessarily give them a long survival rate but if they come early most cancers, if you come early, can actually be treated and the survival rate can be increased significantly if people come early. So again, these are important things. If you talk to people who have survived cancer, they will tell you so many things. That they will tell you that, oh, um, this was a terrible experience, but I'm happy because I appreciated life. I appreciated the, you know, I, I became closer to my creator. I now understand I have to spend more time with my family. I have to take care of myself. All those things that experiences lived through that actually maybe may enhance the person's um, uh, life. So different things for different people. Hospice care, when you talk about hospice, um, we have quite a number of hospices in this country. We have one in Nairobi Hospice, the first hospice we one have in Nyeri. We have one in um, Embu, Meru, Kakamega, Kusia, Kisumu, you know, and quite a number of places might have, have hospices. Um, we don't have a hospice in every county in this country. Where we don't have a hospice, we have been working with the counties to, to, to start what we call a palliative care unit, which provides the same services as a hospice. Now, hospice in the Western culture is when somebody has got less than six months to live, then they are referred to a hospice. And the reason for this is not really because um, they're dying, they're dying, and so they can only get hospice care, it's simply because the health insurance in that country covers hospice care for six months only. So I always tell people, I'm not God, I can't tell my patient you have got six months to live because that is really playing God. People have told their patients you have got six months to live and patients have lived years. People have told patients you've got, uh, you've got years to live and they have lived only months. So it's very, it's not as, it's not really in our place to predict when, how long somebody will live. Yes, we can tell when a patient is dying actively that this patient is going to die because there's so many metastases, but we can't really always be certain. So hospice care in the Western culture is focuses mostly on end of life, towards end of life, the last six months of, of, of life. But for Kenya and other African countries, because we don't have enough palliative care services in the country, hospice care in this country takes care of a patient from the time you make a diagnosis as well. It's not only when they have six months or eight months or a year to live. Most patients will benefit from hospice care from the time you give a diagnosis because the same people working in the hospice, the trained healthcare workers working in the hospice are the same healthcare workers working in a palliative care unit. So again, hospice care, do not think it's only for the dying people in this country. It is for anybody who has a life threatening diagnosis and can actually benefit from it. So if you look at, uh, this is just a diagram to tell you that uh, things have changed over time. Before we used to have somebody comes in with a disease uh, for example, cancer, we treat, treat, and then we wait until they're dying, and then we, we send them for hospice care. So that would mean that these people's quality of life would not really be very good during the treatment because they are not being they're not receiving palliative care, they're not receiving supportive care, they're not receiving all these things. We wait until they're dying, then send them to the hospice. But this has changed over time, so that um, when somebody has a diagnosis from the very beginning, we introduce the palliative care team to this patient and their family. So that as the disease progresses, if it's going to progress, we have more and more palliative care integration into this patient's uh, uh, quality of, in, into this patient's day-to-day -day life and treatment. So that the patient is receiving more of the comfort care that we've talked about, the symptom management, the psychosocial, spiritual, financial, sometimes financial needs they, they, they might have. And then when the patient dies, 
uh, and most patients who receive hospice or palliative care from the beginning have a better quality of life. Research has shown they have a better quality of life, they might live longer, they die a better, a good, a better death. When we talk about a good death is when somebody dies, when their symptoms are managed, when their psychosocial needs have been addressed, when they have made peace with their creator, when they have written their will, when they have decided where they want to be when they're dying. So you find most patients who receive these services from the beginning actually have a better, quarter, a better quality of life. And when they die, the family is actually supported in bereavement. Years ago, once a patient died, that was the end of it. Go home, you know, family members, nobody cares to call them, nobody cares to text them, nobody cares to find out what, what's happening. It still happens this way, actually, in most of our setups. But in palliative care, we don't stop that when a patient dies. We support the family members through bereavement. Am I clear? Am I too fast? Okay, I haven't heard, uh, um, Harrison says, okay, well, Harrison has said somebody has arrived. So in, in short, we are talking about the physical needs of a patient. We are talking about the psycho psychosocial needs. We are talking about the emotional needs. We are talking about the spiritual needs. All these things contribute to pain. And that's what is called total pain. Saunders was the, actually the, the, the lady who started the first hospice movement in 1967 in the UK. And she, she, she actually puts this in a very good perspective when she says, when a patient says, all of me is wrong. A patient might not be in physical pain, but they'll tell you, I'm in pain, Dr. Now, for us doctors, we like to say, but I don't even see any sign of pain on your face. That is wrong. Maybe their pain, maybe they don't, that they don't show their pain physically because in our culture also, we are not supposed to show pain. But also their pain might be financial. They don't have money to pay for their medications. Their pain might be spiritual. What have I done wrong to God for me to get this disease? Their pain could be emotional, psychosocial, all those things. So we need to believe the patient when they say they're in pain. It is any of these pains here. It's not just physical. It's any of this pain. And all these contribute to total pain. So in palliative care, we try to address all these aspects of care for the patient and the family as well. So palliative care is actually not just about being medical care, it's about relationship building with patients and family. It's of course about symptoms, distress and functional status of the patient. It's about exploring of understanding and education about illness and prognosis. We talk to our patients about their illness when you're breaking bad news and then we talk to them about the treatment we are going to give and then we plan together so that they have informed consent for anything we have informed consent for anything we are doing if you're going to give somebody chemotherapy you have to explain to them that it's going to be very devastating sometimes it will do this and this to your body you will lose your hair for ladies that is very important your color will change your nails might come off your skin will be dry you might you'll have severe vomiting and now now we have drugs to address uh, nausea and vomiting but it still happens so we have to talk about all these things now, what are our treatment goals? Are we aiming at cure? If it's an early stage of a disease, we try to ensure that we are actually aiming at cure. If it's at stage four, maybe that's advanced for cure. So what we're going to do is try to maybe prolong life, but might not be able to cure this disease. So again, all those things are very important. Assessing and supporting of the coping needs of the patient are very important. And of course, one of the other things that we really ignore in this country is talking about medical decisions. When I talk about medical decisions, I'm talking about the issue that um, since my disease is very advanced, should I become very sick? Do I want you to take me to the hospital? Not that anything is going to happen that's what to make me, to cure me, but or do I want just to be maintained at home with good care at home? Have I written my will? Do I want to be, should I go into, you know, should my heart stop? Do I want to be resuscitated? Should I want to, you know, do I, or do I want just to be left alone? My okay. disease has gone to my brain, to my, you know, my lungs, everywhere. Do I still want you to hit my heart to make me, you know, to, 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 so that I can continue living and I might live for only one or two hours. Do I want to be taken to ICU? And the ICU part is very important because we have a habit of wanting to take people to ICU when we know that maybe there's no chance of cure. The doctor has told you there's no chance here, there's no chance here. You, can't, you take your patient at home, it's the hospital, they say we can't, we, we can't really do much because um, we can only make them comfortable, we can't do anything about curing the disease. You remove them, you take them to another hospital, that hospital is making a lot of money from ICU, tells you, yeah, 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 we put the patient in ICU, that's great. And then within three days, you're being told, your bill is already three million. And so those are the things we want to help uh, patients make decisions early about them with having uh, conversations with them and their family members, even things like writing wills, 
deciding who's going to be your power of attorney. If you are very sick, who's going to take care of you? Who's going to be the your spokesperson? Who's going to be your voice? Remember to make the right decisions. That, the right decisions that they know you are the decisions you would have made if you are able to make them. So again, those things are very important. Coordination of referrals to other care providers. You know, even at home, who cares for you? How do you get the home-based caregivers involved? These are very important things. So again, psychological issues are very important. People, when they're told you have this disease, even if I'm told I've got hypertension, diabetes, I start thinking, oh, I know somebody had diabetes or my mother had diabetes and this is what happened. She had to buy medicines every month. It was very difficult. Maybe she, her blood her sugar was not controlled. She lost her limb. She went blind. She went into renal failure. All these things are very important things that we need to address, financial issues. Again, so it's very important that in palliative care, we actually talk about psychological issues. These are very important. And I won't go into details, but it's important to remember that it's not only the physical part of it, but also the psychological and, and spiritual part of it that's important. So WHO has come up with a way that we are integrating palliative care into a healthcare system. And it talks about um, you know um, things like having a policy. Right now, we're working on a palliative care policy with the Ministry of Health, National Cancer Control Program. Hopefully, maybe by this year or ne early next year, it should have been adopted. We also talk about education. And if you look at education, the first part of the education talks about media and public. Because if media doesn't get it right, and that's why I decided to start with definitions, if we don't understand those definitions, we might actually not try report it uh, rightly. So. Uh, education of the media, public uh, education, advocacy, into uh, putting political into the medical curricula, nursing curricula, you know, um, pharmacy curricula, all those people working in health is very important. Training of family caregivers, community health workers, all those things are very important. And then once we have a we have, if we have a policy, we have education in, in, you know, in, in, in place, then we have the drugs that we need for palliative care available. And mostly the ones that actually are a problem are the opioids. That is, for example, morphine. Uh, we use oral morphine in this country to control moderate to severe pain, especially that pain seen in cancer patients. So it talks about having the, the, the drugs available, having a good supply chain system that works and all those things. And then when you have all these things in place, you can do the implementation. And implementation then brings in things like opinion leaders, you know, and then training healthcare workers, training other people, bringing everybody. In fact, in palliative care, we say palliative care is everyone's business, starting from the policymaker to the person in the community. It is all our business. So this is very important that we have um, we have this approach. In Kenya, we started with everything else, and now are doing the policy. So sometimes you find you can't tell somebody about a policy unless you prove to them what it is you're talking about and it works. So for us, an institution, we have been working with the public, uh, with, the, with the Ministry of Health since 2010 to integrate palliative care services into the public health care system. And because of the ministry, the counties now seeing the benefits of having a palliative care unit within their county hospital, we are able to tell them now we need a policy. So we started by convincing people through showing them that it works, it has got benefits, and now we are working towards a policy. So also in 2017, the World Health Resolution uh, um, you know, um, had the first ever resolution on palliative care, the first ever, ever. And I'm always happy to report that we were involved, very much involved in this resolution in Kenya. In 2012, Kenya, um, uh, Australia, and the US hosted the first side event at the Geneva w uh, WHO uh, World Health Assembly meeting. And our then Director of Medical Services, Dr. Mm -hmm. Mani, was actually the, the key speaker. And so we were part of this resolution in drafting it. Some of us were, were personally um, involved in drafting this resolution. And it's a very important resolution because it calls all member organizations, all members of, uh, of the World Health Organization to do certain things to ensure palliative care is available, accessible and affordable to people within their own countries. It talks about um, strengthening and uh, it, it developing, strengthen and implement palliative care policies, and which is what we are doing right now. It talks about supporting palliative care initiatives that include providing support to caregivers. Now caregivers are, even as healthcare workers, when you're giving palliative care or supportive care or any of those cares, end of life care, we really go through a lot of psychosocial issues because we, are taking care of a very difficult situations, patients die, patients get very sick, so we can easily get burnout. Again, caregivers at home also, their loved one is sick, might be dying, and they also need to be supported. So this is very important that we support each other 
we uh, try to avoid burnout and we try to also ease the burden. The other thing it talks about is education and training. If you don't have people trained in uh, palliative care, then you will not have providers. So education and training is important, and that's why we have worked very hard with the, with the government and, and, and the training institutions to include palliative care into the nursing and, and medical and pharmacy and, um, and physiotherapy is actually a um, curricula. So we are trying to show that we are hoping that we'll go through across all the other curricula of healthcare workers. And then, of course, um, the WHO resolution talks about access to essential medications. If you don't have the medicine available, you can also, uh, also not, not have palliative care in your, you cannot have an effective palliative care service in your country. Again, of course, it talks about fostering uh, partnerships between government and civil society to increase access to palliative care. And a good example of this is that we, the organization that I work for, and David will be talking after me, is a civil society organization. But we have actually taken the lead over the last years, since 2010. We have taken the lead, and not just taking the lead, but also we have invested funds into the government hospitals in this country, starting with 10 former provincial hospitals, and then we became counties. Now we started working in counties, and we worked with over 40 counties, actually almost all the counties in this country, but have succeeded in over 40 counties, introducing palliative care to the county hospitals. So this is what we're talking about when we talk about relationships, that it's not only the government's responsibility, but the rest of us also need to do our part. And you people, for example, also need to do your part in terms of getting the right message across there. When people hear hospice care, they say, no, we can't take our patient because it means we are abandoning our patient. Hospice care is not abandoning your patient. Palliative care is not abandoning your patient. It is ensuring that your patient gets good quality care. So we need to, to demystify that misconception of palliative care. It is not right to think of it as, uh, uh, as, you know, to think of it as a service that is given only to the dying people. Yes, they are part of it, but it's a service that is given to somebody who has a, a diagnosis that it may be, may be an indication of the fact that they will not get cured of that illness or they will live with that illness for a long time. And that's why we call them um, uh, non-communicable diseases. They are, that's why they are called chronic illnesses, because people live with these illnesses for the rest of their life. And so also, these are the, some of the things that the resolution, the resolution talks about. You can also find this on the WHO website. Um, in Kenya, maybe uh, I just want to talk about our developments. We have been working, like I said, with the government since 2010. Uh, the organization we work for, our mission is, uh, is quality palliative care for all in Kenya. And so what we do, whatever we do, is to ensure improvement of palliative care services across the country. We want to ensure that uh, we are doing the right advocacy, working with everybody, including partners like NCD, uh, NCD Alliance Kenya. We are doing the training. We're not necessarily the ones doing the training, but promoting training and education of healthcare professionals and others, including media on palliative care, that we are scaling up services and uh, um, in terms of scaling up services, when we started, we had only about, um, I think we had about uh, seven hospices in the country. And, uh, you know, and Kenyatta National also was just starting palliative care. But with time, we have been able to work with so many other organizations. And now the, the hospices, I think, about 17 in the country. And the palliative care units in the county are over 40. So actually, we have over 70 sites that provide palliative care in this country right now, as you're speaking, which is very good um, because when we started, we had very, very minimal services available in the country. So these are some of the things that we do. Also, we get involved in research. We want to do research in palliative care to have local evidence for improvement of palliative care in this country. So this is just a map that needs to be updated. I couldn't update it myself as I tried, but most of these places have got either a palliative care unit or a hospice. Some places it has been difficult, for example, places like Mandera, Masabit, Wajir, it has really been very difficult for even us to go and visit these sites physically, but at least we have a, a nurse or two trained. The problem usually is that these nurses sometimes move on because of the, 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 the security issues around those places, but even Trukana now has a palliative care nurse that is, uh, you know, working on improving palliative care in, in Trukana. We want the whole of this country, everywhere, wherever the patient is, for them to be able to access palliative care services because palliative care services are going to be needed, whether we like it or not. We are not getting rid of cancer today. As much as we are trying, we would like to get rid of it, but we're not going to be able to get rid of it in the next many, many years. We can't get rid of diabetes and hypertension unless we really, really work so hard at the community level to change our lifestyles. And that's also why it's come very important for you people to really give a lot of information out there. And we need to start this information right at the, at the primary school level, even in, in kindergarten, what they serve the children in that kindergarten, what are they eating? Are they just eating chips every lunchtime? 
or just eating, you know, I know one of the schools, a uh, uh, friend's child was going to, all they serve is noodles. Those things have no health value at all. There's just sugar starch and all the rest. So we need to give that information so that we reduce the NCDs in this country from the very, very um, young age to whatever, uh, throughout the lifespan that people understand that they need to be able to control uh, their lifestyle, to be able to eat the right things as much as possible, to exercise, to be active. It doesn't mean going to the gym, even just walking, you know, that's a very good exercise. So those are very important things. So we want to reduce the NCDs, but we know that it will take time for us to reduce these NCDs. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, we need services, we need screening, we need prevention, we need promotion, promotion in terms of uh, educating people to understand what this is. We need curative services, we need palliative, we need rehabilitative survivorship services to be there for those who are already sick or are going to get sick. So we've been working really to, 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 to increase palliative care in the country. And these are some of the places that were some of the, the, the nurses working in, in some of those hospices and also in, in um, the Machakos palliative care unit is actually within Machakos County Hospital. So again, within the county hospitals, we work with teams there to start palliative care uh, units within the county hospital. This is actually better and easier because these are usually maintained by the government uh, since they're government facilities. So there are many things we've done. I've mentioned some of them already, uh, integrating palliative care into the nursing and medical curricula, starting a diploma course in palliative care for nurses in KMTC. We hope this will expand just beyond nurses. Having a national palliative care guidelines, having a national palliative care training uh, a curricula, and having palliative care included where it should be included in the National Cancer uh, Control Program with the National Cancer Treatment Guidelines, and then NCD uh, National Framework, in home-based care, in even now in UHC, we are trying to ensure that palliative care is part of the package for UHC. It's not left behind, um, since we talk about leaving no one behind. So leaving no one behind means also including palliative care. And now we're also hoping that, of course, NHIF can also cover palliative care. So um, in summary, palliative care is an integral part of health, uh, of, of health and should be available at every level of care. Uh, relief from pain and suffering is a human right. The approach of poly, the, the human right approach to palliative care is very important. It's very important because, for example, we, we have we have recently, in the past uh, maybe 15, 20 years, Kenya has been focusing a lot on human rights. Uh, many years ago, we didn't know what a right was. We were just, you know, we couldn't talk about any right, but now we can stand up and talk about our rights. And so we have, for example, the Kenya National Patients' Rights Charter, which talks about um, right to promotive, preventive, uh, curative, rehabilitative, reproductive, and palliative care services. So really, a patient can take us to court if we don't provide palliative care services to them because it is their right to receive those to receive those services. And now, of course, like I said, even when President Uhuru was talking about UHC, he mentioned palliative care. He mentioned palliative care. He talked about promotion, preventive, curative, rehabilitative, all those things up to palliative care. So it needs to be fully integrated into our services. Um, people living with the NCDs require palliative care from the beginning to the end, and I mentioned that why they need it, because their life is going to change, they are going to be uh, going to hospital more frequently, they are going to have symptoms, they are going to be living with this disease, they might, if they have got hypertension, have diabetes, they might even develop kidney failure, and then they have now uh, got to dialysis, all these things are things that require support throughout the illness. It's not just, uh, the palliative care doesn't just focus on end of life, and maybe I forgot to mention what end of life is. End of life usually is when now we really, uh, biologically, scientifically, medically know that this patient is not going to live for long. Uh, maybe their, their organs are failing, and um, the disease has gone too far, and now we're just looking maybe on, we're thinking, of, we're talking about a few days, weeks, or a month or two. So that's when we focus a lot on end of life issues. Um, again, during end of life issues, one of the things that is very important is even though somebody is dying, we have to maintain their quality of life, make sure they're not dying with, with severe symptoms. Uh, I have, I've had, I've been called before by family members where they are saying a doctor has said I will not give the, they will not give my family member morphine because morphine is used only when somebody is dying since it's addictive. That is not true. That is not right. Morphine can be used at any stage of an illness, and the patient should not be left to suffer because somebody has a wrong idea about a drug. So end of life is very important. We are always told that uh, a society is judged by the way it treats its dying. How we treat our dying is very important. 
And then, of course, like I said, it supports loved ones, not only about the patient, but the family as well. It prevents or tries to minimize pain and suffering. And I want us to remember that palliative care is about living. It is about living. And that is the really message I'd like you to put out. It's about living, living, living. It's about quality of life. It's not necessarily about dying. Even if a person is dying, up to the last breath, they matter. They matter, and we need to be able to ensure that they are, we are doing the best for them. So just to summarize, this is um, uh, this is uh, what I'm really talking about. This is what uh, Dem Cicely Saunders says. She's the first founder of the first hospice. She says, you matter because you are, you matter at the end of your life. We will do all we can, not only to help you die peacefully, but also to live until you die. Whatever we are doing for our patients, we need to do it with a lot of love because they matter until the last breath. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. So, Ari. I think at this point, uh, sorry? Yes, I, I was just going to say, I, I will take questions later and maybe you can let David um, uh, present now. Sure, I wanted to, 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 to introduce David at this point. I believe, David, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, David. Yes, you can introduce yourself and then go ahead and present, then we'll take the questions. And I will remind the attendees that you can still drop the questions at the chat box. We are picking them and we'll share at the end. Thank you. David? Hi, David. Uh, maybe as we wait for David and he's trying to sort out a few issues, we can take the questions that we've had. I'll just project them on the screen. Dr. Ari, can you hear me?
Um, yes, hi. I'm uh, sorry. I was I, I was muted and, and a call came in and I was muted. So the questions are: What are the financial estimates of having someone on palliative care supportive care? Um, uh, supportive and palliative care are not expensive. Uh, you have removed the question. So oh, okay, is David ready or do I continue? David, I think he's the one who has removed. I don't know. Okay. David, can you hear me? David, can you communicate, please? David, are you on? What's happening? I don't know. I don't know what's happening with him. Okay, why don't you put yeah, the question? Sorry, just the questions. I'll, I'll, sort of so, I'll, yeah, I'll so, discuss with him. Think, for example, the hospices in this country provide very, very subsidized fees. And most of them will never turn a patient away because a patient doesn't have money. They will support the patient and give them maybe a, a, a payment plan. Their services are not very expensive. It's only maybe when you come to a home visit, they might charge for the for the home visit because they have to use fuel and everything. Palliative care within public hospitals is given through the public health care system. So whatever is charged in, in, a, in a, for example, in a KNH or Neary or, you know, County County is within the the, 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 the the charges that the household has usually, which are very highly subsidized. But one of the things, uh, if you are an inpatient, then your palliative care services will be covered through NHIF, like any other service. So we are trying to we are, one of the things we are trying to do is to fight for uh, NHIF to also cover the uh, outpatient services as well as the home visits. So it's not an an expensive service because we are, we don't require very uh, you know special equipment or anything. We actually are able to work within what is in the, within a hospital. So don't be, um, you know, uh, intimidated not to send a patient for palliative care services because of the finances. Finances are usually a problem when people have to pay for their chemotherapy, radiotherapy, surgery, or the uh, the, the medicines they take regularly for their N, for their NCDs or their diabetes or hypertension. The medicines might be expensive. The medicines that are aiming at controlling the disease will be expensive in some places. So again, one of the things we are trying to do is to also fight for NHIF to cover these services for patients. So when you're giving studies about hospitals across the country, are there figures inclusive of private facilities? Yes, uh, I put a website, the link there. If you just Google www, www uh, sorry, if you Google kehpca.org, that is uh, our organization, kehpca.org, it will take you to our website. On our website, our work has a place where it talks about uh, palliative care services, uh, where they are found. So the services are not just in, pub in, in public admission hospitals or in hospices, they are also in private hospitals. Aga Khan Hospital has a palliative care, two palliative care doctors working there. Nairobi Hospital is actually setting it up now. MPSHA doesn't really have, but some of them have some of those services. So we are trying to also um, encourage all of them to, to be able to provide palliative care, uh, comprehensive palliative care services. I've really learned a lot about palliative care, which I didn't, sorry, I was on the third question. I've really learned a lot about palliative care, which I didn't think it exists here in Kenya. I only thought of palliative care at home. Thanks for today's teaching. Yes, it exists. Please go on our website. You will learn a lot about what's going on in our website. We also have a newspaper, a news, a website, um, an online news, news. Uh, I don't know what you call it. We call it eHospice. eHospice is an, an online um, uh, platform for news about palliative care. And we are one of the countries that are the contributors. So we have an eHospice Kenya. Um, platform, you can learn a lot about what's going on in palliative care in Kenya. It is right to tell the patient that what that is going to die soon or how. When you tell a patient about their diagnosis, you have to know how to do it. We have been taught how to do it. We don't just go and tell a patient you are going to die. No. We have a way we break bad news and we actually ask the patient what they know about their disease, what they think about the prognosis of their disease. We let the patient lead us into knowing how much they know. And from there, we can talk about the illness. And people will understand when you talk to them and tell them that uh, uh, you have this disease and it's at this stage and this is what we'd like to do for you. And these are the goals that we're aiming to achieve. And this is how we are as, 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 uh, imagining the prognosis will go. So all these conversations prepare a patient, even if they are going to die. And towards the end, if a patient asks you, am I going to die? And you know they're actually dying. We usually say it is good to be, to be, uh, to, you know, to, 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 to give the right information, the correct information to be truthful, but in a very sensitive manner. If a patient is really sick and feels like he, she should die, 
Is euthanasia part of palliative care? No, no, no. Palliative care was developed as a alternative to euthanasia. People would ask for death when they had very severe cancer pain and, Dr. and Cicely Saunders is the one who started using morphine for pain management and also doing counseling, psychosocial care and spiritual care and realized once these things were all done, the request for euthanasia went down drastically. Hardly anybody asked to die. And I've had patients myself also who would come and say, I just want to die, Dr. Harry. And I say, why? And we talk about the reasons why they want to die. And we address those issues. Is it pain that is unbearable? Let's, let's treat it. Is it because you feel you're a burden? Let's talk to your family. And the next day, the patient comes and they're not talking about death. So we need to find out what, why are our patients asking to die. Euthanasia is illegal in this country in any form, whether it's voluntary, involuntary, whether it's physical, but done by a physician or not, even suicide is illegal in this country. So again, we need to remember some of those things are not are not illegal in this country. I can't see the next question, but I don't know if David is ready. There was one more question. How how is palliative care, supportive care status in Kenya now? Is it accessible? Yes, to is a, we have, like I said, we have over 40 counties that have a palliative care units within their county hospitals. We have some hospices, and again, on your, if I'll ask you again to go back to our website. All that information is available there. Um, it's just that people don't know about this. They don't refer patients. Even the healthcare professionals don't refer patients. Some healthcare professionals don't refer patients because they think if I refer this patient that I'm making money from to, to the hospital, the palliative care unit, I'll not be able to make my money, which is very wrong. And diabetes is one of the diseases that can actually be, uh, benefit from diabetes, from palliative care. But again, people think palliative care is only for cancer patients. We need to demystify that. It's for any serious health-related illness, any life-threatening illness, adults or children. So again, that is uh, one of the things we can talk, we, you know, you can get, you can always get in touch with us. My email is on that presentation. We can look at how can we enhance, uh, enhance awareness on this issue. Tunisia is illegal in Kenya, yes. It is illegal, illegal. I don't know if it will ever become Ill illegal, but it is illegal because what we focus on is trying to address the patient's reason for Tunisia and managing those, 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 those things that are making them want that uh, to be euthanized. Thank you. I don't know if David is, uh, is that. Let me call him. I don't know what's happening. Huh. Hello, I think David is ready. David, oh, can okay, you hear fine. me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? David, you're not sure, responding. Sure. You've told us what's happening. You've just been hanging there. Can you hear me now, CP and Tim? Yes, we can hear you now. Yes, David, you can go ahead okay, uh, and present. And uh, apologies for the audio issues. Okay, sorry. Um, um, my name is David uh, Musioki, and I work for KEPCA uh, as a program, I mean, an advocacy officer. I'm glad to be here. Thank you, Zippy, for your presentation, uh, which highlighted what palliative care entails. Eh? And so um, I will take you through um, the, the, the topic, importance of inclusion of persons living with palliative care needs in advocacy. And uh, I'll be glad to take your comments or questions uh, at the end. If you have any question, you could put it on the chat uh, and I will respond at the end. So, uh, what is meaningful involvement of persons living with palliative care needs? I'll use this acronym as I get as I go on. Uh, and so, um, persons living with palliative care needs. I think Zippy earlier on has covered what. Uh, or the, the, the category of persons that we talk about or people that suffer from conditions that are hard to cure. And uh, it means then that us as professionals, as organizations and as institutions recognize that there is great value of lived experiences. And so um, they need to be part and parcel of the discussions in terms of care or in terms of uh, uh, planning 
and 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 uh, composure of programs. So it requires use of appropriate mechanisms, uh, of course, to leverage on their knowledge, their skills, and their insight, and as well as uh, their thoughts. It, in, it involves or it includes three key things in terms of involving them in planning in decision making. And one is listening to the persons uh, to understand what their views and their priorities are. In palliative care, we say listening with a third ear to understand uh, the story behind the words they say or uh, to get to understand the level, uh, what is going through them. The second thing is inviting the people living with palliative care needs to play an active role in projects. Eh? And finally, is to recruit them so that they also take responsibility over whatever is being planned or being done. For me to elaborate uh, this in a better way, uh, allow me to share this case scenario. A case scenario of uh, a patient, and it's a real one. I only changed the name uh, of the patient, Maria, who has been battling cancer for many years. And like Zippy has mentioned, some of the conditions that require palliative care include cancer, HIV, uh, hard to cure diseases like kidney diseases, heart conditions, and so and the so. So Maria has been battling cancer of the breast, and uh, has been was diagnosed about seven or so years ago. Definitely, many visits to hospitals, many tests being done, many procedures. I mean, she underwent many procedures, and eventually she had to undergo. Uh, mastectomy, that is removal of one of her breasts. And that made her feel very awful, very sad state of affairs. If and you, when she, yes? Can, can you try and, and center your presentation so that we can see the entire presentation, please? Um, okay, just one minute. Or, or can you project from your end? It seems I'm having a little bit of a challenge from this end. Is that okay, Arison? Hello, Harrison. I'm working on competition in, in a minute. Sorry, participants, for that mess up. Is that the presentation? Yes. So if you could go to the case scenario. Next slide. Next. Yes. So uh, I hope you all can see the case scenario. I was talking about this patient called Maria, uh, battling cancer for many years. I said about seven years. And she's had to visit the hospital many for many years and has had many procedures done on her. And so uh, about uh, in, in, in 2019, that is last year, uh, she had stabilized. And so one of the during one of the visits to the hospice or to the palliative care unit where she was receiving palliative care, uh, 
she was uh, identified as one of the persons that was invited to participate in a three days training organized by KEPCA and our stakeholders uh, about uh, advocacy to equip the participants, you know, with knowledge about how to, um, you know, uh, talk about their experiences and being involved in terms of packaging care and advocacy for their own issues as from a patient perspective. Eh? And so during the training, Maria kept reflecting and, and she saw that there were so many opportunities concerning her care that she would have talked about. And so the journey between her as a client or as a recipient of palliative care started really uh, after that training. During that training, definitely, and I don't want to go into the details now, but the, the participants are just taken through basic uh, stuff about objectives of advocacy, uh, how to understand the audience in terms of when you're packaging messaging, I mean messages, and how to deliver content based on their experiences. Just there. Don't, 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 still on the case. Eh? Uh, she, she, sorry, come back to the case. Yes, there. Yeah. So, so uh, as, as part of uh, the training, uh, Maria was able to pick up herself and understand that she's a change agent, definitely from uh, the perspective that she went through a lot. Eh? And so she went back and picked up herself, you know, from the all aspect of pity and, and feeling really sad for herself. And from the many questions that she kept having within herself, like, why me? Why now? At the age of 32, why should I lose my breast? And, and, and then decided to be part of uh, advocacy for other patients or other uh, recipients of care probably wouldn't have an opportunity to speak. And so she went back and uh, was able to start a, patient, a support group with fellow patients. Uh, when she just did this, there was an opportunity for her to make a presentation in one of the international conferences, palliative care conferences in Rwanda. And she just came and gave several talks uh, when we had ministers of health and other dignitaries uh, at the conference. And her speech really made a big difference in terms of what she went through. Coming back, she was also able to book an appointment with her county through the, the speaker of the county and was given a slot to address the MCS in our, during the county assembly. She's been able to teach many or to talk to many patients during support groups. She's been part of WhatsApp groups advocating for palliative care and uh, different aspects of support. She's given uh, talks to churches and schools when before COVID. And all this is because uh, she was involved as part and parcel of palliative care and has become a great champion. We can go to the next slide. So uh, some of the gains, next slide, please. Some of the, the, the gains that we learned from this case is that in that county, and that's, that's, that's the Nyandarua County, the county government has been able to dedicate some budget specifically to pay for NHIF insurance for patients with cancer. It's a big gain. So they, they, they go through a certain registration and at least they are paid for, and that way they are able to access care. Uh, there's also been funding to increase awareness in terms of prevention of NCDs, prevention of uh, cancer and, and uh, cancer-related suffering in the different villages and schools. There's, there's also been uh, the hospital that is in Olkalao and also uh, in other counties like Kinyeri, taking 
uh, initiative and factoring decisions or uh, comments from people living with palliative care needs because of this kind of advocacy. It has enabled patients, individual patients, to be really well informed about NCDs, uh, definitely leading to reduced stigma, and they are able to support each other, they are able to link each other to support systems and stru support structures that are available. Like I said earlier, lived experiences uh, become a basis for decision making, especially when we are planning for care both locally, nationally and internationally, other than relying on theories. Next. Next, next slide. Keep, keep going. Okay, so um, based on this case scenario and looking at what earlier Dr. Zipora has said in terms of uh, some of the areas that we'll need to highlight and involve people living with palliative care needs as part and parcel of the solutions that we require. And especially from, since I'm talking to media personalities, eh, what are some of the areas that at least we need to capture and capture well when we're talking about needs of people living with palliative care needs? One is increased ac uh, availability and access and funding for early diagnosis of non-communicable diseases including hard to cure diseases. But who is affordability of treatment and financial protection for those affected by NCDs? Like I said, when we involve the persons with uh, living with conditions already, they are able to articulate in a better way and based on their experiences. And therefore we'll be able to, you know, uh, advocate and channel support properly as, as need be. The other uh, need or area of advocacy is uh, access to trained quality healthcare providers at all levels, so that when that patient goes to the, you know, community kind of level institution, which are the health centers, they are able to get the right information. Other than somebody being treated for ulcers for two years or for five years, yet. Uh, they require just to be referred upwards for proper diagnosis. So there will not be missed opportunities when we have trained uh, quality healthcare providers. The next thing is ensuring universal and equitable access to treatment for NCDs so that at any point in this country, we'll be able to have access to quality care and proper treatment. The other thing is comprehensive care which is all aspect of care, physical support, psychological support, social support to those with NCDs, including spirituality support and, and, and all that. So the, the comprehensive approach to care. Uh, the other aspect is uh, disease management, education and counseling for self-care skills for those with NCDs. I think that's self-explanatory and having proper standards and guidelines to link clinical and community support programs for NCDs. And, and finally, is able, so that we're able to articulate properly uh, and address issues of end of life like Zippy just talked about and palliative care for persons living with palliative care needs. Next. The next slide, please. So, uh, so lessons from advocacy, some of the lessons that we learn from advocacy, uh, they, there, is, there is this uh, um, slogan that we've learned, especially with uh, the HIV and AIDS world, that we, we, we can't say we are providing care uh, to people if we don't involve them. So it's nothing about us without us. And we can't also really articulate properly, like we understand issues 
unless we agree with George Herbert, who says it's only the wearer of the shoe, uh, who knows where it pinches most. Next slide. So the lessons we learn from in inclusion or in meaningful involvement of persons living with palliative care uh, needs. Uh, one is good health profoundly affects both the patient and family's daily functioning. Because when somebody is sick, when just one member of the family is unwell, eventually it's like the entire family is sick. And therefore, uh, when we talk about quality of life, it's about supporting the patient and as well as the other uh, family members. Since we're talking about UHC or universal health coverage, this discussion cannot be complete without really inclusion of palliative care. And like Zippy alluded earlier, uh, the National Association has been championing these discussions. And at the end of the day, we will need involvement of everyone and so as media persons, uh, it's great that we having you on board and you'll be part of the change agents uh, discussing about palliative care and inclusion of palliative care in these UHC discussions. Uh, the, the, the other thing is about palliative care discussions by all and including uh, persons living with palliative care needs should be part of these discussions. So finally, Keep going. So, so finally, uh, we, we, we're glad to, to be part of this discussion. I just highlighted on one of the case scenarios. We've had several patients or uh, persons uh, uh, living with palliative care need that are doing exemplary work in the different areas from their communities. Some have gone out of their way to uh, influence certain changes in, in many ways, there are those who are leading in, in terms of uh, uh, championing patients' uh, needs, legal needs. Some patients who have been, you know, who have suffered because of being sick and they are being thrown out of their homes or their properties. And, and they become change agents who link patients to, you know, lawyers or pro bono lawyers who are able to advocate for their needs at their levels. And at least eventually, at least they get back whatever has been uh, unnecessarily taken from them. And, and, and we, we really don't do much in the different localities without also involving the persons living with palliative care needs. So I'll end it at that and I'll uh, be glad to receive your comments or questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, David. I'll be projecting the first question for you in the screen in a minute. There you go. Great, thank you. So the question is, allow me to ask, maybe according to your research, Doctor, is there a percentage of how many families support their members uh, while in such situations? And if the percentage is lower, what could be the reason for this? Um, how many families support their members? Okay, I'm not so sure whether the question is very clear, but uh, uh, is it about family members supporting patients while they are sick? Uh, uh, maybe so. just to I think, I think they're asking about, uh, I think that question is asking um, support for family members, um, support of patients by family members. And maybe okay. I can just answer what I talked about uh, that, that earlier on. Uh, I think okay. most of our families in Kenya actually do support their patients. Um, and the good thing is we still have um, the family unit in most of our parts of the country. Uh, they, they, the patients mostly are supported by their family members, but of course there are challenges that could, uh, could, could, uh, could appear. Challenges, for example, the family members may have, may have financial burdens 
There might be issues of distance. Maybe they don't live with their parent who is sick in the same city or the same place. There might be issues of not, not having, the family members not having the proper information about the patient's illness. And that's why I talked earlier on about the fact that, for example, family members panic and take a patient to go to ICU and ICU is just going to do nothing but increase the, the payments of, of increased bills for this family. But yes, a lot of our family members are receptive to taking care of their patients. It's very, very few, very few rare occasions that you find a patient has been abandoned completely. When a patient sometimes is taken to a hospital or one of the inpatient hospices, it's not because the families don't want to support them always. Sometimes it's because the family could be in a very difficult situation. Maybe their finances are very low, they can't even afford to feed this patient. Maybe the home they live in, sometimes I tell people, they, they, it, sometimes they live in a house that is just falling apart, there is nothing, even a toilet or anything. So the patient might be better off in an institution. So for so many reasons, they might bring the, 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 the patient to an institution, the patient is crying because they are in pain, they have not been taken care of. But maybe if we address these issues and take care of those things that are making the patient very uncomfortable, then the family becomes very receptive and can still continue to take care of their patient. So there are many, many dimensions that we can look at in this question, but generally, and just to summarize, families in these countries are still very supportive of their loved ones. Sure. Thank Is you, Dr. And, and David? Uh, I haven't seen any questions in the chat box, so I believe there are no more questions for, for from, from the media. So maybe I'll, 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 I'll hand it over to Frederick to take over. Frederick? Yes. Thank you, Harrison. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Zipora and the, and the colleague for um the wonderful presentation that you have taken us through i believe we have been able to learn as much uh, yeah so i had indicated uh when we were starting that we just wanted to take a photo um a group photo so if you guys don't mind i think harrison from your end you can have a full screen of everyone okay. is that right yes okay so I, I would let everyone to just put on their their cameras on and then um, once you have everybody you can, you can take, we can take that photo i think it, it will be great so Harrison, as you as you do that, I really want to continue appreciating everyone for always creating time to join uh, these sessions. I want to believe they are of great help, and they are helping us to also shape up our uh, content. Um, this week uh, we've had a couple of engagements because we had some other side webinars that um, I extended invitation for most of us to attend. And I'd like to appreciate everyone who had an opportunity to attend those webinars. Uh, the latest was yesterday's um, about World Organ Donation Day. Actually, personally, I was hearing that for the first time, and I think it was a, a good thing. The conversation was awesome. And the press release also for from the group or support group of persons living with uh, NCDs that also was awesome. We have uh, news pieces that uh, ran on that day, and I understand we have some of us who are still doing some uh, uh, some of those stories for print uh, on the newspapers and. We'll really appreciate by the time you are having uh, them published, you just send us the link uh, so that we can have um, uh, we we can also have an opportunity to just have a record of them. Um, so moving forward, I will I will I will be able to communicate to you uh, that when our next session is probably next week. Um, uh, but if you have anything 
that you would want some uh, information about, you can always reach out, you can inbox me. I'm also making arrangements now. Um, we, we might experience a little bit of delay from our um, uh, usual uh, bundles or airtime tokens, but be sure that I'll be working on it uh, so that we are on the same page. So thank you so much. Harrison, have you been able to take a, a photo of everyone? Predict some of us have not put on their mic, so I'm just waiting for a number of them, then I'll take a, a, that screenshot. Okay, is it their mic or their camera? It's their cameras, apologies. Oh, oh sorry. <clears throat> okay, I think we are, we are, we are, we are 50 of us. So I want to believe maybe if there is somebody who has not been able to put on their cameras, we might excuse them for now because our time is really, okay, I've seen a, a number of us have added up. About 52. Okay. Are you still good or your your screen is still a little bit not filled up? Harrison. I think uh, really? I think I'm good. I think I'm good now. Uh, thank you. Oh, you're good, okay, fine. Okay. <laughs> Well, uh, are you done? Yes, I'm done. So maybe Dr. Tari from your end can say a word and then we close. Okay, thank you so much. I think at this point I'll welcome Dr. Tari Kezi, our technical advisor, who will say a few words and then we we'll close for that. Thank you, Harrison. Okay. And on behalf so of the rest of us, can mute. Sorry. On behalf of NCD Alliance, I'd like to thank Dr. Zippy and David for this uh, presentation today. I believe that this has really enlightened us as to what palliative care is all about and the need for us to even. Um, access palliative care for ourselves, for our families, so that we can improve the quality of life for our family members and our friends. So I believe that um, <clears throat> this has enlightened you and you'll be able to demystify palliative care to your audiences. And as we've always said, if you do have questions, and as Dr. Zippy has said, you can contact her, or you can send your questions to us and we'll make sure that they get to Dr. Zippy and David. So once again, I'd like to thank all of you for your um, participation, for staying with us for the last one and a half hours, and even for the support that you've given us during the course of this week at the press briefing and also yesterday during the organ donation week. And we look forward to continuing engagement and also supporting each other as we create awareness of NCDs in our communities. So thank you very much and um, I wish you a happy weekend and we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you and goodbye and God bless you as you continue with the work that he has given you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tari, and thank you everyone. Uh, yeah. Harrison now you, you I think you, you can you, you can end the meeting from your end.